Now, in that framework, what I want to suggest to you is that part of what happens, and part of what Millikan does a lot of, is let people do things for which they are recognized. They liberate people to, to, to achieve excellence. They allow people to work beyond their job definition. They give them a level of responsibility and creativity which allows them then to be, to, to be participants in the continuous improvement of the company and to make hundreds of little suggestions. Because one of the things you're going to discover out of this is, the, is, is that most of the time, it's not the giant leap forward that matters. It's having specific little breakthroughs every day, but having so many of them that the cumulative effect is a giant leap. And this leads to recognition. In Japan, uh, the leading award for being a company of quality is called the Deming Award after Edwards Deming. In the U.S., the, it's called the Baldridge Award after the former Secretary of Commerce. Now, I want you to understand the reason, one of the reasons we're focusing on Dr. Edwards Deming today is this is a man whose impact in Japan was so profound that their top award for the highest quality Japanese company is the Deming Award. In 1950 or 51, uh, he was invited, he'd been in Japan earlier uh, as a statistician. Uh, he was invited back to talk to what he described as 80% of the capital investment in Japanese manufacturing. They had about 400 people in a room and for three days he taught them. Now, he later developed that into a four day, 10 hour a day course and he taught it until he died at 93 years of age. Uh, we're, gonna give, we're giving you a very brief two hour overview of what is truly an extraordinary system. And he's left behind people who study Dr. Deming uh, and his work all over the world. But the reason for prizes, this is a very important first point, the prizes and awards and honors are signals to people of good behavior. And this is very important because it's very different from normal American behavior. The trick is not to say, I think I will now do something so I can win the prize. The trick is to behave in such a way that the prize is a signal to others to study how you behave. Let me draw the distinction. One of the great dangers with the Baldridge Award is that people will try to get the Baldridge Award so they can then run an ad saying, this is how good we are. That, that's a very misleading way because it's an external motivation. It's a manipulative motivation. The trick is to say, I want to be the highest quality company in the United States because that's the best way to serve my customers. That's the way to stay in business. That's the way to create jobs. And oh, by the way, they honored me by giving me the Baldridge Award for being the best at what I do. As distinct from, now what gimmicks do I, again, all of you think about courses you've taken. What gimmicks do I have to do so the Baldridge Award Committee will give me the award so I can then run the ad? Do all of you see the difference? Huge difference in why you're doing these things. Recognition for internally driven achievement is good. Seeking recognition for external motivation is bad. Very big difference in what you're doing. Getting an A because you actually mastered physics is good. Getting an A because you conned the teacher into thinking you'd met the requirements is bad. And if you have an A-driven system rather than a physics-driven system, you have truly broken the back of learning. So just take that and think about what's gotten, why, why we're having such huge problems with education in America today. Because people are extrinsically motivated. What do I need to do to get enough credits to get I mean, How many of you have friends who take college courses in order to get the credits so they can get out? Seriously, raise your hand. How many of you know somebody who takes courses in order to get the credits to get out? As opposed to taking a course in order to learn the material. So you've got to rethink why do you do things. Let me also suggest the reason that, that I focus on Deming uh, and, and use up 10% uh, of the course on this topic is that with a I believe with a culture of quality, Americans can outcompete anyone in the world. I believe that for, for, for three reasons, that, 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 so you understand. This is not just Pollyanna, oh gee, we're wonderful, we can win. One, we are a continent-wide nation. We're huge physically. I mean, only China and Russia are comparable to us, and, and Australia uh, are comparable to us in scale, and I guess Brazil. <coughs> Everyone else is just smaller. I mean, people talk about competing with Japan. Japan is the size of California, and about 80% of it is, 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 is mountainous. In the long run, Japan's not competitive in terms of the sheer resources. Second, we are the most ethnically diverse society on the planet. I mean, if we ever get our act together and are truly organized, you want to send a, a, a salesman to Nigeria who fits in? Fine. You want to send a salesman to China who fits in? Fine. 
I mean, we are an extraordinarily diverse society. So we bring more potential creativity from more backgrounds than any other civilization in the world. Third, because we are an individual society where you are endowed by your creator with individual liberty, we have a greater capacity to liberate energy, to liberate creativity. I mean, if you talk about the Deming model of everybody playing a role, everybody helping, continuous improvement, there is no other society on the planet that is as consistent about saying everybody can play. So we should, in the information age, easily be the dominant competitor on the planet if we decide we have to have a civilization committed to quality and to profound knowledge. I believe that quality can transform government, and that we need to really think through how do we apply this, these ideas across the system. This is much deeper than simply reinventing government, to use a, a current phrase. This is literally rethinking from the ground up. How would a customer-oriented system behave? What, how would you design it? And you'll see by the end of these two hours how different it is. I think quality can transform services. It's not just about manufacturing. It's about any systemic, systematic human behavior. And so it's just, just as applicable to the newsroom or to uh, an insurance company as it is to making cars. It's important to understand, and this is one of the great problems of dealing with a lot of consultants on this topic, that quality and profound knowledge are not gimmicks or management techniques. Quality, you know, quality is not you know, putting up a sign on the wall, on the wall or hiring somebody for a two-day course to teach you the five, the five habits of quality. Quality is very different. Quality and profound knowledge are essentially cultural, intellectual, personal. It is a way of seeing things, a way of doing things. It's a way of life. Now, I spent about 60 hours with Dr. Deming um, over a three-year period. And it was like peeling, unpeeling, or peeling an onion. I mean, I started with his ideas as he would explain them, and then I'd ask him a set of questions. Then I'd go off and think about it. And then I'd come back and ask him more questions. What I discovered was that Deming had a cultural worldview that represented America between 1910 and 1930, and that started with, with levels of integrity and hard work and sincerity and decency that were integral to American civilization. And that those were his assumptions. They were working assumptions on which he then built his philosophy. And so you had to really listen carefully because he's talking, when he talked about quality, he was talking about a way of life. He was not talking about a gimmick. A way literally of, 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 of getting up each morning and how you felt all day, how you thought about things all day. Think of it this way. We codify our beliefs and ways of doing things into processes, systems, and structures, whether it's business, education, or society. In other words, uh, how do you answer the telephone? You know, uh, are, are you friendly? Are you orderly? Are you organized? Uh, how do you deal with customers when they walk in? What are your habits? How do you take phone messages? Is it a habit, or is it random pieces of paper scattered all over the house? And it's a very simple example, but think about it. How do you decide to learn how to cook something new? Do you randomly experiment, or do you have a cookbook? And what you find is that the people who are really effective consistently codify things. They think through, what are my habits? What are my structures? And all a large system is, is a series of structures and habits. So we have a habit of building a car at the Ford Motor Plant. We have a habit of how we do a appendectomy operation. It is this set of processes. So it's very important. Do you, you understand what I'm trying to say here in terms of the notion? If, when you, it's not magic. Every time you encounter a set of behaviors, you can say, what are the habits and systems and structures that that behavior is an example of? How do TV people operate as compared to print people, for example? Print reporters type. TV people talk into a camera. Very different ways of presenting. They need different quantities of information. Print people, the, the entire evening news is less than a full page of a newspaper. So if I'm a TV reporter, I need to know the right 40 seconds. I mean, watch how short the time is for a TV reporter to speak. And then say to yourself, I'm going to spend all day, I'm going to be on the air one time, and I need 40 seconds. How much do you have to know to do 40 seconds? And then think about the reporter who writes uh, a, a very long article. Look at the difference in density and the habits that implies. And so you go through and you ask yourself, what are the, uh, what are the beliefs and ways of doing things that were codified? Good ways to go look at a Waffle House, which is a great little system. 
I mean, they hire people, they train people, you suddenly have a short. Have you ever tried imagining doing what that short order cook does? Have you ever just sat there at the counter and listened for a while as the various waiter, waiters and waitresses yell the orders and it somehow all works? Can you imagine yourself being, you know, well, what is Waffle House? It is a very highly organized set of habits and behaviors and systems. And, you, and they train people very quickly into learning how to do that. And they do a very good job. 